Good evening. Whoa, hey, microphone works this time. Uh, thank you all for being here. If you uh, just treat it like church, where you scoot towards the middle uh, and uh, uh, allow people to sit down if, if you can. Um, welcome. Uh, it's nice to see another full house. This has turned out to be a, a, a wonderful lecture series that we've been doing now for a year. Um, yeah, please, come on. Don't worry about disturbing me. Um, I like to begin my comments by saying, I know that nobody is here to see me. So I will, I will go quickly through this. Uh, the format that this is going to take is I'm going to give as much time as possible to uh, Dr. Miner. And uh, uh, afterwards, we will have a moderated question and answer session. So if you have questions, please just uh, submit them in writing. And we'll have uh, some students who will come around to collect them or pass them forward uh, if, if you can figure out an orderly way to do that. But uh, we'll, st we'll have some students who will uh, collect them. The survey that you were given, the uh, lecture series questionnaire, this is something that the uh, grantee has asked for us to do just to uh, you know, see how he does. Uh, and then uh, this is also being recorded for YouTube. So you know, try not to do anything you don't want permanently put up on the internet tonight. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to say a special thank you to, uh, uh, um, uh, to a couple of people who, uh, uh, first I'd like to thank the uh, COS Foundation. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, um, COS administration for making this all possible, um, uh, Tim Foster, and, uh, and, and then just a lot of support we're getting from uh, COS administration. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, Steve Miner uh, is a director of the Contemporary History Institute. Uh, hey, he's the director of the uh, Contemporary History Institute at Ohio University and uh, one of the world's foremost authorities in Soviet history. And um, I will let him demonstrate that uh, to you himself. So uh, here is Dr. Steve Miner. Thank you. Thank you for showing up on a Thursday. Uh, I hope I will make your time worthwhile. Um, I would like to thank everybody who has helped me come here, uh, Tim, for, for doing the, the paperwork, but pr particularly to Professor Toodle, who is not only a former student of ours at Ohio University, but has also become a friend. It's one of those great things that after somebody has been your student, they grow. It's kind of like having children, in a sense. When they grow up past a certain point, they become your friends, and, and you enter into a whole new relationship. We're very proud of Steve. Uh, he's, he's a dynamo. Those of you who know him know that to be the case. And I, we just had him back to Ohio with a number of our graduates. We've had our PhD program working for 30 years now. And he was one of 23 graduates we brought back. It's, it's a real pleasure to see people out there doing good work, advancing the cause of history, educating new people. It really makes you proud. I told my wife after we came home after that event, it was my, it's a wonderful life moment. I realized that a lot of what we did was worthwhile. So I'd like to thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm going to talk tonight about, it's a, it's a grand title, Why Stalin Defeated Hitler. And it's a little more ambitious than what I'm actually going to say because, of course, you can't really make a comprehensive lecture that explains the whole truth behind the Soviet victory over the Germans. What I can say is some things that we don't, are not widely known and are poorly misunderstood and some new information that's come out of the Soviet archives. Uh, one of the things that I've tried to stress in a very busy day that Professor Toodles had for me today, I've met with three classes and one group of students and um, had several meals. It's all been very exciting, but by Ohio time, it's approaching midnight. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it, one, one point I've made is that doing the history of this period is, is terribly exciting because the Second World War, we all think we have a a clue of how it happened. We have a narrative in our minds. It's firmly established in documentaries. It's firmly established in the History Channel, back when it was still the History Channel, before it became the Oddballs Channel. Um, <laughs> but when they did documentaries, uh, we have a sense of how the Second World War worked out. And we have a sense of how the Second World War worked out on the Eastern Front. Unfortunately, this sense is almost entirely shaped by German records. Because up until 1991, the Soviet Union didn't divulge any of its secrets. Yes, there were some memoirs, some of them very useful, that came out during the Khrushchev period. But the sources were very few. And the records, the official records, were kept secret until 1991. 
Uh, they've been coming out a, a great deal since then. The Soviets are, and the Russians after them, are quite proud of the record of the Soviet Union during the Second World War. And so they've published masses of, of documentary records. Uh, thousands of pages, thousands and thousands of pages. There are seven 1,000 page uh, uh, books of volumes of documents dealing with the Gulag alone, all in Russian. Uh, all of which is very interesting. We're able to do the, the real history of the, of the war from the Soviet side for the first time. And what this does is it dispels a lot of myths. So what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is, is our view of how the war unfolded. And then I'm going to say a couple of things, particularly about the Soviet economy, that we've learned since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Well, press it the wrong way. Okay, right side up worked better. Uh, the, the Germans, of course, invaded the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941. It was the beginning of the largest land campaign in history. There were four million, over four million Germans and allies, and they struck a Soviet army that was about five and a half million strong, although only two point something million were actually in the western borderlands when the Germans attacked. So the Germans, for the first and really the last time, outnumbered their opponents, at least on the fighting line. And the uh, progress was swift, the progress was devastating. Um, they advanced, this is a map, they surrounded large numbers of, of Soviet troops, and in a number of, of uh, encirclement battles, they advanced right to the very gates of Moscow. They reached the gates of Moscow in October, about mid-October of 1941, and a panic broke out in Moscow, and Moscow came as close as it came during the whole war to collapsing on October 16th, 1941. Uh, this, this, the government dissolved, people panicked in the streets, people broke into stores, and it looked like it was gonna be 1917 all over again. Uh, some Germans claimed they claimed clo came close enough to Moscow that they could see the spires of the Kremlin. That's balderdash. I know the geography of Moscow from the direction that they arrived, you can't see a darn thing downtown. Uh, but they came very close, so close that if you go to, to Moscow today and you go to Sharmetyeva Airport, uh, there is a plinth that stands between the airport and downtown Moscow, and it has a tank on it. And that's where the Germans got to. In other words, they got between the airport and downtown. Uh, so this was a very, very close-run thing. We all know that. There's no, no secret there. And what people attribute the German loss to, or failure to take Moscow, is General Winter. You've heard this before. This is, I, could, I could show you hundreds of photographs like this. This is my favorite, though. You look at this poor horse. Uh, the German army we tend to think was mechanized. Uh, that's actually one of the things that's not true. Uh, the German army that invaded the Soviet Union, and we've known this for a long time, but it hasn't sunk into our understanding. They invaded with 600,000 vehicles and 650,000 horses. Uh, it was a horse-drawn army that invaded the Soviet Union. And it was also an army that was very much bound to railroads and not to roads, and just as well because the roads in the Soviet Union looked kind of like this. Um, so part of the defeat is attributed to the weather. Who could have predicted that the weather would be bad in the Soviet Union in fall? Uh, <laughs> certainly not anybody who's lived. Um, so the, you have this. You also have the masses of the Soviets counterattacking, well-equipped in their snowsuits, driving back against the Germans who are poorly equipped, not prepared for the winter. Again, who knew it was going to come in winter? Uh, they, they attack and they drive them back because there are simply masses of them. Again, this, this notion of masses of Germans attacking is a relic of, of German military memoirs, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Mother Russia, one of the things that holds the Russians together supposedly, and they're always called the Russians in historiography. For some reason, we very rarely refer to the Soviets. It was, of course, the Soviet Union. Uh, but the, the Russians and Mother Russia, Russian patriotism, bind the Russians together sufficiently that they defeat the invader. And you get this kind of stuff, too. Uh, Russian patriotism. This is a poster from a little later in the war, actually, 1942. And it says something, he who comes to our land with dreams will perish from those dreams. Uh, in other words, hearkening back to Alexander Nevsky of the 13th century and Russian patriots who had resisted a previous Teutonic invasion back in the 13th century. So there's Russian patriotism. That's one of the things that held... Russians together. Also, the atrocity propaganda. I say atrocity propaganda. I probably shouldn't have put it this way on this slide because the atrocity propaganda was true. Uh, it's almost impossible to exaggerate the ferocity and the sheer bestiality of the Nazis 
in the Soviet Union. I'm constantly astonished when I travel back to Russia at how nice Russians are to Germans. Uh, given what the Germans did between 41 and 45 in the Soviet Union, it's amazing they speak to them civilly at all. Uh, it, it, was, it was truly, truly a, a, a terrible war. Uh, Hitler referred to it in March of 41, before he invaded the Soviet Union. He said, this is not a war like other wars. This is to be a war of extermination. He said, we are not to regard the communists as a comrade before or after the battle. Those are direct quotes from him. Uh, they were to exterminate the enemy. Okay, so you have atrocities that also bind the Soviets together. And, oh, let me go back a bit. Um, shouldn't get there, yeah. You have the idea that uh, production, and I, I thought production came first. The Russian steamroller pushes the Soviets, uh, the Soviets push the Germans back. And you get this in, in German memoirs, uh, Monstein's memoirs, that are still in print. They were first published in the 1950s. They're still in print. If you go to a Barnes & Noble, you can get Guderian's memoirs, you can get Monstein's memoirs, you can get Melanton's memoirs, all these Nazi uh, generals. You can get their memoirs, and they've been in print for 60 years. And they all tell the same story. We were outnumbered. We were such clever soldiers. <laughs> who couldn't expect winter? We were such clever soldiers who invaded the Soviet Union. We did so well. But the weather beat us, and the masses of Germans beat us. There's a line from Monstein that says, Where, what place is there in the world for military art when you're outnumbered by five or six to one? So that's, his, that's the argument. They were, it was the steamroller. And of course, the Russians in 1945 roll into, uh, um, uh, into Berlin, and they defeat the Germans. Uh, well, this, this, this view of, of history isn't entirely wrong. There's some, a lot of truth in it. The German-Soviet front was, in fact, the main front of the war. Uh, Americans like to flatter themselves into thinking that uh, the Western Front, battle of the D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge were the big uh, victories of the Second World War. I remember Tom Brokaw standing on the cliffs looking out over Point de Hoc in Normandy on the 40th anniversary of D-Day and saying, this is the anniversary of one of the bloodiest battles in human history. It wasn't the bloodiest battle that month. The bloodiest battle that month was in the east. It was Operation Bagration. It was the largest defeat ever inflicted on German arms in history. They captured some 600,000 German troops. Uh, so it was a huge defeat. Um, the Russians point this out, that, that three quarters of the Germans that died at the front in the Second World War died in the East. And they're right about that. Uh, at, for 1941 and 1942, it was a higher proportion than that. Uh, in 1941, virtually 90% of the German army was committed to the invasion of the Soviet Union. A slightly larger, a smaller percentage in 1942, but still a vast majority. It's not until 1943 that the Germans had to protect Italy, and, and France against the possibility of an allied landing in that area. So uh, the, the Western allies never faced more than a quarter of the German army in combat. Uh, one of the things that's always stressed is the ability of the Soviet economy to mobilize for war. And it's partly true. I, I wouldn't say that it's not. The, um, the Soviets did mobilize more effectively. They certainly mobilized women more effectively than any other country in the war. Uh, we all, of course, we're Americans. We all know about Rosie the Riveter. Um, but Rosie the Riveter was only 15% of the industrial workforce. Uh, women constituted 56% of the industrial workforce in the Soviet Union. Uh, we now have the figures from the Soviet factories on that. Uh, so they did mobilize quite heavily. And they produced tanks, tanks, tanks. When you read the accounts of the Soviet Union at war, they always stress their productive capacity. And the thing they always cite in proof of this is that they produced 98,000 tanks. They did. They produced 98,000 tanks. It's a tremendous number. Uh, the United States produced some 80,000, 87,000 tanks, not including armored personnel carriers or, or half-tracks. Uh, the Soviets didn't make that distinction. And, but 98,000 tanks is still a lot. And it's just under twice as much as the Germans actually produced. You know, they always point to the production capacity of of the uh, Soviet economy. It produced the necessary sinews of war, the Sturmovik aircraft. This is a dive bomber. People have said, argued that, yes, the Soviet economy was a problem. It was a problem before the war, certainly, when it led to starvation during the collectivization. And it was certainly a problem later on when it led to, it was one of the major factors leading to the collapse of the Soviet Union. But, they say, during the war, the command, centralized command economy, showed certain virtues in wartime production 
that more decentralized economies don't show. And that this was really its, its, its acme, this was really its, its central virtue, is winning the Second World War. Um, it produced the T-34. When the History Channel used to do World War II stuff, they rated this the top tank of all time. Uh, well, okay, it was the top tank of all time. Only one in five uh, T-34s had radios at the outset of the war, it's worth noting. Uh, there also weren't that many T-34s in 1941, it's also worth noting, but that, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, the evacuation of industry is also seen as one of the great, uh, the, in, I've already talked about the mobilization, but the evacuation of industry is seen as a great, great victory on the part of the Soviets, and it was. They moved 1,500 factories from the western portion of the Soviet Union to the eastern portion to get them away from the Germans and relocate them east of the world, Ural Mountains where they would be invulnerable to air attack and invulnerable to German occupation. It's been referred to as an economic Stalingrad. Again, not untrue. It's one of the great achievements. The other argument is that Lend-Lease assistance on the part of the United States and Great Britain to a lesser extent, oh, one more point about this. Uh, the argument, I, I guess I have a pointer here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, one of the arguments is that Stalin, in, in great foresight during his two five-year plans before the war, lo relocated the fulcrum of Soviet industry east of the Urals. This is, well, I did have it working. Yeah, there we go. This is what's called European Russia, the, the area between uh, uh, um, Poland and the Ural Mountains. There it goes into Siberia. And the argument was that Stalin, in the first five-year plans, understood that the Soviet Union was threatened from the West and so relocated a lot of factories east of the Urals where they would be invulnerable to attack. This was first advanced as an argument by an American, believe it or not, a, 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 a graduate of Wisconsin who graduated during the Depression, had no place to work, went to the Soviet Union, worked as a welder, came back and wrote about having worked in Magnitogorsk and said, Stalin really saw this war coming and so he built the factories to the east. So that's another claim that is made. Uh, Okay, archival revelations. Like I said, not all of this is wrong. The Soviet Union was, in fact, the main front against the Germans. The Soviet Union also suffered a tremendous number of casualties uh, from the war. It, exactly how many for a long time we didn't know, and we still don't know exactly how many. But the number 20 million was kicked around for a number of years. The genesis of that is really quite interesting. Uh, Kennedy asked Khrushchev how many people died in the war. It was a state secret. And Khrushchev said 20 million. And that number was used as the official number for decades. Basically an offhand comment by Khrushchev. Uh, nobody knew. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Soviet demographers have gotten to work and Soviet historians have gotten to work. And the best estimate now, based on Soviet casualty figures from the Red Army and from other re medical reports, is 27 million dead. 27 million dead, which uh, compared to the 400,000 that the United States suffered during the war. It's, it's a tremendous imbalance in terms, if you think of war as being fair, which of course it isn't, uh, that, that they suffered immeasurably more than we did during the war. Uh, 27 million dead is a, is a huge number. To put it in perspective, though, not only did those 27 million people die, but you had a number of people whose, whose physique was weakened, they were weakened by war wounds, and they died prematurely. If you count those people in, the number is 35 million. 35 million is, of course, greater than the population of the state we're in right now, which is the most populous state in the country. It's more than every last man, woman, and child in Canada. And that number, again, doesn't mean much in isolation. Okay, pop population of Canada, but the Soviet Union is a big place, six of the world's surface. It had 172 million people at the outset of the war. So from 172 million people, they lost some 30 to 35 million people dead prematurely or directly as a cause of the war. Even more frightening, as a thought, of anybody who's ever served in the military, and I'm sure some people here have, 34.5 million people served in the Soviet armed for forces during the war. Of those, 8.5 million people died in battle. Let that sink in. That's, that's an enormous figure. Only 800,000 Americans saw sustained combat in the Second World War. 8.5 million Soviets died in combat, died as, as a direct result of combat. It's a huge, huge figure. The, the view that I've given you here is uh, of the traditional view, and it's one that I used to teach because we didn't know anything more. But since 1991, we've had archival revelations. This is actually one of them. This is 
uh, a photostat of uh, a, a signature with, uh, a, of a document from March 1940 with, this is Stalin's signature in his own handwriting, Voroshilov, Molotov, Mikoyan, and this is added by a secretary for two other people who weren't present. This is the order on the part of the Soviet leadership to shoot, to execute 15,000 Polish army officers in the spring of 1940. Something that we always thought the Soviets had done, we now know, we now have the documents. Uh, but there have been a number of archival revel uh, revelations and I'm gonna talk about this. On almost every point that I've just mentioned, there needs to be some correction. In some cases, it's outright false. First of all, the Soviets, it's often argued that they retreated on purpose. I'll come back to this slide in a minute. They didn't retreat on purpose. Stalin tried to hold every clod of Soviet earth. In fact, the, the, the line was, don't surrender one clod of Soviet earth. The war is to be fought on the enemy's territory, not on our own. This is a map of the deployment of the Soviet army on the eve of, of the German attack. If you notice, it's incredibly heavily lo uh, uh, loaded towards the front lines. This is something that some of his commanders had warned him about. The doctrine of the Soviet army was offensive doctrine. They assumed they'd have plenty of warning of an attack and they would prepare a preemptive strike. In case the Germans were building up, they'd attack the Germans before the Germans attacked them. They, in these two salients here and here, they put most of their mobile forces. Uh, Zhukov claims, he warned Stalin, and I think it's true, that these things were vulnerable being so far forward. They were, they were actually mostly within our artillery range, believe it or not. And they were also vulnerable to encirclement, which is precisely what happened in 1941. Uh, they, they really, they, it was a disastrous deployment plan, and it's entirely Stalin's doing. This is what the Soviet blow was. It's the biggest blow any state in modern times has received and still remains standing. The Soviet army at the outset of the war was 5.7 million. By December of 1941, 3.2, or 3.3 million, excuse me, Soviets were in German hands in P as POWs. And another two million were uh, killed or wounded. So it was entirely, the entire army that was at the frontier, in fact, more people than were at the frontier were either dead or in German hands. But you look at these other facts, these other figures. They only lost 8.7% of their territory. The Soviet Union's a big place. You saw that map earlier. It covers 11 time zones. The Germans never captured all of European Russia. They only, cap only captured 8.7% of Soviet territory. But that included 44% of the population centers of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is heavily weighted towards the West. They captured 44% of the population centers. It's true that about 12 million people fled, but 70 million Soviets underwent German occupation. It's as though the United States was invaded and occupied from the, Pacific, to the Atlantic coast to, to uh, the Mississippi. It would be that effective a blow. 63% uh, of coal mining, 71% of iron mines, 42% of electricity generation, a third of rail lines. You see it. 93% of Soviet aircraft production in German hands. We now have these figures, which we didn't have before in, in detail. Uh, it also, the masses of POWs, this is entirely a result of poor planning on the part of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had a bigger army than the Germans. There's no reason it should have suffered as it did had there been a plan for defense in depth. Stalin had had shot the people who prepared defense in depth uh, in, during the purges of 1937 to 1938 of the military. People who had prepared guerrilla war, who had prepositioned supplies for resistance if the Germans invaded or another, another state invaded, he had them shot. He had people who, who uh, argued for coastal defense shot. He had a number, of, uh, in other words, of, of army officers who talked about retreating into the depths of Russia and using its spaces. He had them shot because he saw them as defeatists, encouraging a, a foreign attack. Uh, we also referred to Russian patriotism. I, I mentioned this before. This is misleading. Uh, a lot of history, histories talk about the great Russian soul, Russian patriotism. Russian patriotism was a factor in the war. There's no doubt about that. But the Soviet Union isn't Russia. And you gotta get that out of your head. Even, even some colleagues, of my, a colleague and friend of mine, John Gaddis, still, he insists, he refers them to, to them as the Russians. The Soviet Union was a multi-ethnic empire. It, it had about 150 different nationalities. The, in the last census before the war had Russians as 56% of the population, still a majority. But, and this is important, the Soviets, during their collaboration with Hitler, 1939 to 1941, 
annexed territory containing 23 million people, almost none of whom were Russians. By 1941, in other words, Russians were only a bare majority of the country. Uh, they were the largest, they were certainly a, a majority, and they were certainly the largest single minority or, or, or nationality group, but they weren't all Russians. And it's very doubtful whether talking about Alexander Nevsky or Peter the Great stirred the hearts of your average Uzbek or your average Kazakh or your average Georgian, for that matter, other than Stalin, who was himself Georgian. So the, the notion that sort of Russian patriotism was what exactly held this Soviet army together isn't entirely persuasive. A lot of Soviets collaborated. We have a lot more information on this. 1.8 million Soviets, people of Soviet origin anyway, served in the German armed forces. The Wehrmacht was, one, it was 18 million strong. In other words, one out of 10 people in the Wehrmacht were people of Soviet origin. Uh, I have a document from right after the Battle of the Bulge from um, Eisenhower who said that 5% of the people in custody, in American custody as POWs, 5% were Soviet in origin. You'd say, well, what's the difference between 5 and 10%? Most of the people who were Soviet were not used in the West, and they weren't used at the front line. These people were incredibly important to the war effort on the German part. Every Ukrainian, every Belarusian, every Tatar, anybody who served in the ranks freed another German soldier to serve at the front, which meant that they could more effectively fight. And the Germans, uh, for all of their other shortcomings, were very effective fighters. Uh, the, the, the Soviet Union had the largest number of collaborators, both proportionately and in overall numbers, of any country that engaged in the Second World War. Uh, death sentences. It's often said that Stalin ramped down the killing during the Second World War. That's not true. Uh, during, in the pre-war purges, 1937 to 1938, Stalin had had 700,000 people shot. Let that figure sink in. This is in peacetime, 1937 to 1938, in his political purge. 700,000 people is slightly more than the United States lost during the Civil War on both sides. And this was in peacetime. He also shot much of his officer corps in a pre-war purge of the officer corps, a fact that we were talking about earlier today. Uh, more officers died in the pre-war purge than, than died in the Second World War. And this is a country that lost 27 million people. This is the civilians executed during the war for treason, desertion, uh, defeatism, spreading rumors, uh, complaining. There, I, I have diaries of people who were shot for complaining about food. What army, what people don't complain about food? These numbers are striking. And of course, they're, they're at the worst. The worst time was 1941 to 1942 when the Soviet Union faced its grimmest threat from the German attack. They tail off dramatically towards the end, and you think, okay, it's a reasonable number. I just looked this up uh, to, to see, to get context. The United States is one of the few countries in the world that still uses the death penalty. We have a lot of criticism for that. Whatever your point of view on that, uh, we, we're one of the death penalty countries. So I looked up how many people have been executed in the United States. Since Jamestown, fewer than that number. That number is, in and of itself, very high. And it doesn't even begin to talk about this. There's 100,000 100, people. And it wasn't the only death thing. The Gulag continued to operate during the Second World War. 900,000 Soviets died in the Gulag during the Second World War. The death rate in 1942, and this is, this is from Soviet archive records, from their own records, the death rate in early 1942 was 24.9% per annum, a quarter, which is higher than the death rate in the German concentration camps during the war. It was very high. The German concentration camps, the non-death camps, was about 5 or 6% per annum. 24.9. Now, some of that was because of the dislocation of the war, and you know, it was beyond anybody's control. But they were certainly lethal. The, the gulag didn't disappear during the war. The surprising thing is that it still operated, and it still drew people in. 15 million people were sentenced to prison during the Second World War from the Soviet Union. 15 million people. The numbers do decline during the war, but here's the thing. They took a million people out of the, of the concentration camps and put them into the army. They amnestied a large number of people who were, they didn't amnesty the political prisoners, they amnestied the regular prisoners, uh, people who were guilty of arson, rape, and stuff like that. They kept the people who'd done nothing wrong in the prison camps. Uh, they, they also uh, had a huge influx of women because they had all kinds of labor laws during the Second World War that punished tardiness and punished changing your place of work. The gulag went from being 7% male 
uh, 7% female, excuse me, before the war to being 30% female during the war. Uh, so you had a big influx of women, and you had a large influx of new prisoners. The myth about the Russian steamroller. This is the most pernicious myth, I think, of the Second World War, and it's one to which we, we can put place squarely at the feet of German memoirists. They talk about you know, firing at these Russians who attacked in swarm, Asiatic swarms, and we kept shooting at them until our machine gun barrels melted. They talk about these people were Asiatic people who were indifferent to the suffering of their, their fellows who died before them. They'd step casually over their, their corpses. The Soviet Union, at the outset of the war, as I said, had 172 million. It increased to 193 million by 1941. The German Reich, the larger German Reich, had 90 million people in it. Do the math. There are no Asiatic hordes. hordes. There just aren't. There aren't the numbers to, to, to justify that claim. Yes, there were a large number of, of Soviets who died, and yes, they were replaced by factors that I'm going to talk about. But this notion that they had endless supplies of people to throw against the Germans is nothing but a myth and an easily disprovable one. It's not even, not even a good lie. It's, it's a particularly bad lie. And it's a very pernicious one. The myth of the Soviet economic production. Uh, the, the idea that the Soviet economy, the failings of the Soviet economy that it showed before the war and that it showed so abundantly after the war that they somehow disappeared during the war is false. And we know a lot more about the Soviet economy now than we used to. Agriculture in particular, this, this is a picture of women pulling a plow. Uh, all the horses were requisitioned for the front. There were very few horses left. Most of them had died during the collectivization of the farms. So they had fewer horses in 1941 than they had in 1930, and all of them were a requisition for the front. You had cows pulling uh, plows. You had women, you had elderly people pulling plows, and of course all the men were sent to the front. So you had an enormous drop in agricultural production. Lend-lease is going to be one of the topics that I'm going to focus on, because for one thing, we don't know much about Lend-lease. Believe it or not, the, the histories of Lend-lease were written by Americans in the 1970s. And I know some of them. Warren Kimball, a friend of mine. I've been to Russia with him. Uh, George Herring, I actually saw him last week. He wrote one of the first histories of, of Lend-Lease. They were written in the 1970s when the documents on the Western side became available in Britain and the United States. And they're very good. They, they, they detail what we sent. What they don't do is explain what happened to it once it got across the ocean and what it meant to the Soviets. We, it's been a black hole. They, they take, it, take the stuff as far as the docks, but they don't take it any farther than that. It went through a number of different routes, some of which were surprises to Americans. Uh, everybody thinks of the Arctic convoys as being the principal route into the Soviet Union. Everybody's heard about this. Around Murmansk, around Norway, the frozen uh, Arctic convoy. Only about a quarter of uh, Lend-Lease supplies went that way. A quarter of them went around Africa and into Basra. Americans should know where Basra is by now. Uh, in the Persian Gulf, and it went up through Iran. Half went across the Pacific and went into Vladivostok. Why this is so surprising is if you look at this map, they have to go through Japanese territorial waters. And the way this was done, half of the supplies went through Japanese territorial waters. What we did is we, we built Liberty ships out the wazoo. We then labeled them as the USSR. They put floodlights on them. It says big USSR right along the side of it. Oh, I don't know, do I have a picture of that? No, I don't. Um, big USSR floodlights at night to make sure that the Japanese saw it and they flew Jap uh, uh, Russian flags, or Soviet flags. They went through Japanese territorial waters. Sometimes the Japanese would board them, but as I, I talked to one of the Lend-Lease administrators before he died, he said, yeah, they'd come on the ship, they'd check the stuff out, the Russians would pump them full of vodka, and they'd leave perfectly happy. They, they, they didn't interfere because they didn't want to have a war with Russia. They had signed a neutrality pact in April 1941. They let them go. So half the supplies that went from the United States to the Soviet Union went right through the Japanese waters. This is the, the balance sheet. You have 2,660 uh, ships that arrive, 16 million tons of goods. Okay, how big was it? This is a guy named Voznesensky. And Voznesensky was the head of Goss Plan, the central planning of the Soviet Union. And he came up with a figure that has been almost like a holy relic of a figure to people ever since. He said it, that Lend-Lease assistance, yeah, it was important, but it wasn't all that significant. It was about 4% of Soviet production during the war. And this number has been repeated ever since. And it's still cited by some historians, strangely enough. Um, Voznesensky, for his pains, he wrote this book in 1948, 
sadly for him, he was shot by Stalin two years later. But still, the book is in print. I actually have a copy of it. And people still cite the number as though it's based on something. Oh, let me go back. Oh, yes, no, the spam. Let's go to spam. Here's, here's, a, here's a th something I, I, I learned. The Soviets had markets during the war. 56% of Soviets didn't get any rationing. Peasants didn't get any rationing. They didn't receive a bread ration. They didn't receive a leather ration. They received, there was no rationing for the peasant population in the Second World War. They were expected to fend for themselves. And the, the, the urban population, although they got rations, the rations were more like a hunting license than a, a real ration. And so what they had to do is they had to go to peasant markets. The Soviets allowed these markets to exist. And the reason I've got spam up here is because they sold stuff in these markets, and we actually know what the Soviets paid for goods. Remember Woznesensky with his 4% figure? His 4% figure is based on some uh, bureaucrats in Moscow saying, Sherman Tank, I'd say that's worth 2,000 rubles. Boots, I'd say it's worth 20 rubles. That's what we paid for shoes before the war. In other words, they made up numbers, and then they attributed these numbers, and they figured out how, how much it was as part of the Soviet economy. But we have an insight into what people actually paid for stuff. They sold pork on the markets in Russia. And the NKVD, the Soviet secret police, monitored what people were paying. And so I did a sort of spam index to figure out what Western goods were worth. And guess what? If you take the 2,400,000, et cetera, et cetera, uh, 2 billion, excuse me, uh, pounds of spam that was sent to the Soviet Union, you may not like spam, but it's awfully good when you're hungry. Uh, they, they, if you figure this and put it into rubles based on what Russians were paying in their markets, it's worth a year's worth of, of medical care in the Soviet Union, and it's also worth all the money that was given to mothers with dependent children, so orphans, for a whole year. That's spam, and spam was only a small part of what was sent to the Soviet Union. They sent tanks. Now, when I first tried, started writing the chapter on this, and it's only a chapter, the Americans sent 7,000, 7,500 tanks, the British sent 5,000, and the Canadians, tanks. And I, I used to think, and I used to teach, that this really wasn't that significant. The Soviets, after all, produced 98,000 tanks. How important can 15% be? Uh, well, it turns out, actually, really quite important. Because what nobody ever did was look at how many were lost. The Soviets produced 98,000 tanks. This is my own graph, by the way. It's kind of confusing. I'm sorry. It's, the colors aren't good. But the um, blue is produced, red is killed. In every year except 1945, the Soviets are in deficit. Because although they produced 98,000 tanks, they lost 96,500. The Germans always killed more tanks than the Soviets did. And they were always knocking them out. I also have information when the, when the Germans got to Moscow in 41, and, the, and, and people always say Lendlease didn't matter in 41. When the Germans got to Moscow in 41, the Soviets had 40, 400 tanks in front of Moscow. 400, that was all they had protecting Moscow. Uh, Churchill had sent, back, go back to the British here, Churchill had sent 466 tanks in September, September of 1941. British tanks were, in, to some degree, the margin of victory in Moscow. Now, it was Soviet drivers, Soviet courage, Soviet blood. Uh, I, I actually call the chapter, we paid in full in Russian lives. The Russians used this stuff, and they used it well. But it was really important, and it came at a crucial time. The reason the numbers of tanks are so low is, is not because they weren't useful, although they, aren't, they don't really look very good. Uh, this, this tank was pretty obsolete by the time we supplied it. And this one is the ferociously named Valentine. I, I, I love the British names for tanks, the Matilda and the Valentine. You go into, go into battle with your Matilda and your Valentine. Uh, they, they were not particularly ferocious or effective tanks, but I'd rather have one than a cloth coat. And uh, they were very important when they got in. And the reason there weren't more supplied is because Stalin told us in the summer of 1942, I don't need tanks, I need other stuff. And they stopped providing them with tanks. This is one thing people didn't look at. When did the stuff come in? What was asked for? When did it come in? What was needed? And if you look at that, the story makes a lot more sense. This, by the way, is also the Soviet versus German tanks. I'm sorry, the colors aren't very good. But this is Soviet, and this is German. Until 1945, they're pretty much equal because the Germans are killing them. Now, those of you who've done any kind of economics know margins are everything. Not enough is not only not enough, it's disastrous. And 15% counts a lot when you're equal, when you're on par. Uh, 
And so the, the tanks actually were, were more important than even I thought. Trucks. The most, one of the most important was trucks. And this is not something new. Uh, we've known the number for a long time. We sent almost 380,000 trucks, which I calculated at 20 feet per truck to be 1,423 miles of trucks. It's, it's a big number. And, uh, but, it, but more than that, the uh, Soviets only produced about a quarter of a million trucks during the war. So we outproduced the Soviets, but here's the even more important factor. We outproduced the entire German production of tanks. We sent more trucks to the Soviet Union than the Germans produced during the war. The Germans produced something like uh, 360,000 trucks for all of the fronts that they had to cover. So the, one of the points that I'd like to make in this is that you know, the, the Germans were always complaining, oh, there's so many Soviets, they keep throwing people at us. The reason they were able to do that, and Stalin explained this to, uh, to Roosevelt and to Churchill at Tehran. He said, we don't have that many more men. We have about a three to five advantage on the front, but we've got mobility. We can hit them. We can hit them here and we can hit them there and they rush in their reserves and we hit them someplace else. The reason they were able to do that, they had trucks. And these were trucks, along with something like 15 million spare tires, by the way, they sent them trucks that were able to operate cross country. The German trucks, were rubbish in comparison with this. They couldn't operate cross country and in mud. And so this was a tremendous advantage. Jeeps, the Soviet produ the Union produced no cars during the Second World War. They produced no command cars. You won't find any photographs of command cars of, of the Soviets. They used Jeeps and they used Bren carriers, the, the uh, British version of a sort of Jeep. Uh, they, we produced locomotives. Now, as I said, I've known Soviet historians. I've said I'd come back to this. The Americans studied the stuff till it got to the docks, and there were some Soviet, stuff, Soviet historians who studied the stuff once it was there. I know some of these people. I know them personally. Georgi Kumanyov, I stayed with him for a summer in 1992. He writes, he's the, the Soviet historian about lend -Lease. He's also an ardent Stalinist. He has one of Stalin's pipes. He has uh, Molotov's pince-nez uh, glasses, and he did not like Yeltsin. And when I said, why is the, why is the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs building painted red, he said, it's probably the color of the Jews. Okay, so this is a man with what you'd call rather repellent political views. Uh, his, his writing was designed to show that the Western assistance wasn't significant. Their claims were it came late, it came after the victories in Moscow and at Stalingrad, and it wasn't that big anyway, because they, after all, only sent us 15% of, of, of our tanks. He mentions the locomotives, and he says, well, they sent us 2,000 locomotives, no big deal, we had 25,000. True. However, the Soviets produced no diesel locomotive engines in the Second World War. All of them came from the United States. The, of the 25,000, a third of them were lost to the Germans. Many of the others were coal-burning relics of the Tsarist period. Many of them were narrow-gauged uh, 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 railroad cars. These were heavy-duty trains that could haul heavy-duty stuff. And he says, oh, they also gave us some other stuff for railroads. And here's the thing. 97% of heavy rails were supplied by the United States to the Soviet Union. 97%. 80% of Soviet cargo traffic went by rail. The Soviets didn't produce very many rails during the second, 3% of their needs. This is really important because when the, when the Germans advanced, the Soviets tore up their rail lines. When the Soviet Union advanced, the Germans tore up their rail lines. Uh, this was a third of the Soviet rail lines that were being torn up twice over. They needed to replace all this stuff. The replacements came from the United States, and they came in, in it's, it's classified under other stuff. But the other stuff is actually very important because those, the remainder of those uh, rail lines don't run without it. The Soviets didn't have to get it there. Uh, this is an Arctic convoy, it's just fav my favorite picture, so I wanted to put it up. But it shows you the, the, the shipping that had to get this stuff to them. The Soviet Union didn't produce ships during the war. Uh, that's a really important point. You can produce a hell of a lot of tanks if you're not producing aircraft carriers. Uh, and you, you can produce an awful lot of, of tanks if you're not producing destroyers, if you're not producing battleships, if you're not producing tenders, if you're not producing landing craft, if you're not producing rails, if you're not producing trucks, if you're not producing locomotives. You can produce a lot of tanks. And people have been transfixed with the tanks. And they forget that they weren't doing the other stuff, that the Soviet economy was still weak, 15 million pairs of boots. The Soviets had a problem with leather, in part because collectivization of the farms had killed many of the livestock in the Soviet Union, and the rest of the, the, the cows were of pretty poor stock. They also had drafted most of the peasant lads into the army. 15 million pairs of boots came from the United States. Here's another thing, and this, it's funny the questions historians don't ask. 
They talk about the economic Stalingrad, moving these 1,500 factories east of the Urals. And they did, and it was a wonder, and it really was a wonder of management. I don't mean to deny that, and I, I, I hope you're getting the sense that I do give them credit for a lot. Moving 1,500 factories is great. Try moving an iron mine. Try moving a bauxite pit. The Soviets lost their, their coal production. All of the Donbass was lost. It didn't produce a single ton of coal for the Soviet army in 1941 and 1942 or for most of 43. They didn't produce any aluminum. It was all in the West. They didn't produce a lot of iron. Something like 70% of iron supplies were in the West. You can relocate factories. You've got to produce something in them. Guess what? The United States produced stuff. Uh, sent, sent them raw materials. This is some, some examples of the raw materials that were sent. The untold story of lend -Lease. There's page after page after page of stuff that the United States sent by way of raw materials. Food is probably, in my view, the most important thing. The Soviet Union was one hungry country during the Second World War. I have documents going back to Moscow from 1944 talking about people in Sverdlovsk, which is not a provincial town. Sverdlovsk is a main city on the, 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 the uh, Trans-Siberian Railway east of Moscow. One of the bigger cities, third, I think it's third or fourth largest city in the Soviet Union. They were eating cats and dogs, and 20,000 people were suffering from dystrophy. In 1944, this is when they're pushing the Germans back along the front, when they're inflicting the worst defeat on the German army in its history. They're starving at home, and we were supplying them with food. The Soviets call it Vtoroi Front, which means the second front. It was ironic. It was meant to say, yeah, you give us food, we'll do the killing and we'll do the dying, but we like your food nonetheless. We sent them a lot, of, people have done a lot of studies of this, about how much poundage we sent. You know, how many pounds per person? And they've done these intricate calculations. The thing is, we didn't just send them Snickers bars. We sent them stuff that was high protein and high fat. We sent them, in other words, meat, high protein. They didn't have enough protein in their diet. They didn't have a lot of meat. And we sent them things that they had not seen, dried milk. This was something that was unheard of. In, in the Soviet Union, and we sent them what they called Roosevelt eggs, dried eggs. Uh, this, again, high protein, high energy stuff. We sent them cooking fats, um, comjure it was called, and some more un, un, unprepossessing stuff, bully beef, those are the numbers, and tushunka, which is one of the more revolting things that Russians eat. Uh, it's congealed pig fat. Mmm. Uh, but, you know, for those of us who look down our nose at it, when you're really hungry, this is high energy stuff. And uh, there, is there really any difference between spreading salty pig, pig fat on a piece of bread and spreading salty butter fat on a piece of bread? Uh, it's a matter of taste. Uh, they're both about the same, nutritionally speaking. Anyway, it's a delicacy in the, in the Soviet Union. I, I've had it before. I've had it. it. Sometimes they serve it as rinds. It's like eating candle wax. I, it's not to my taste, but I recognize the world is not ordered for Steve Miner's tastes. Uh, here's some more tushinka. Spam, the miracle food. I have one story to tell about that which relates to a graduate student that we both knew. He was a, uh, a son of missionaries. I've told this story to some students already in the audience. But um, son of missionaries in, in Hawaii, doing tough duty out there in Hilo. And uh, they had some Russian visitors right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And being on, on a rather modest income, they cooked up some spam for their visitors. And tears started to flow on their visitors' faces. And it was because these people had survived the siege of Leningrad. And you know how smells bring you right back to a particular point in your life. They could remember when the blockade was broken and the first food they got was spam. And they associated the smell of spam with the smell of survival. Uh, this is the, the sort of result. This is McCoyan, who was in charge of the Soviet side of Lend-Lease. And this is a quote from him, and I don't like putting quotes up on the board, but this is a really important one. He told my friend, Georgi Kumanyov, the slightly Stalinist anti-Semite, that he's, he's a nice guy for an anti-Semite. Um, imagine what an army would be like if it didn't have food. You have all the equipment, you have all the training, and you starve to death. Here's the thing. The Soviet Union had a famine at the end of the war. The Soviet Union by population was about 150 million people by the end of the war. 100 million of them suffered severe Famine. Two million people probably died in the post-war famine. Imagine if the food aid had been removed during the war. Imagine if that famine had hit not in 1946, 45, 46, but it had hit in 1944 or 1943. This was a war-winning weapon. And let me just conclude with a couple of other observations, for which I don't have slides, but nonetheless are important points. Lend-lease assistance allowed 
the Soviets to send seven to eight million more peasant soldiers into combat than they would have done had they had to produce food on their own. Seven to eight million people. The Soviet uh, economy was so overheated, so overcommitted to production of war materials in 1943 that it could not continue at that level without outside aid. Because the civilian economy, and particularly food, would have simply collapsed. They would have either collapsed or had to reassign seven to eight million peasants back into agriculture. The Soviet army that moved in, went into Berlin had a frontline strength of 6.5 million people. The battle deaths in the Red Army, as I've already told you, were 8.5 million. Seven to eight million people were sent to the front because of Western food aid. And let me point, one last point. Everybody here knows about the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan is the great success of American post-war foreign policy, and the one great success that's unquestioned in terms of American foreign assistance. We always talk about a new Marshall Plan for this group, or this group, or this group. We've talked, I don't know how many Marshall Plans people have proposed in my adult lifetime, but a lot. In that plan, $13 billion was spent in four years and distributed to 16 countries in Europe. Okay, that's the Marshall Plan. Lend-Lease to Russia, which lasted about three and a half years, was $11 billion in 1941 dollars. By 1947, the dollar is worth a little less than it was in 1941. Not marginally, but a little bit less. And it was added to by uh, more than a million pounds of British assistance. And this was over three years and to three and a half years and to one country, not to 16. In other words, it's huge. But here's, here's the final fun fact. If you make those $11 billion into modern dollars, the figure, the comparative figure is 190 million modern 2015 dollars. In other words, assistance to the Soviet Union is equivalent to 60 years of assistance to the state of Israel. That's a big, big foreign assistance program. And it's one that we don't understand and we've never really fully understood the impact of. And with that, I would take questions from you. Gentlemen, that's Stephen Miner. What's that? Okay, yeah, thanks. So how the question and answer will work, uh, we have some people who are distribute. Just raise your hand and we'll, somebody will get you a card if you'd like to write a question on a card, just to make sure that you, somebody sees your hand. This is the Soviet method, to write it on right. cards and pass it up. And uh, while they're doing that, I will, uh, I will also uh, uh, give a plug for uh, the College of the Sequoias and remind those of you who are community members that these cards are being handed out by COS College Republicans. And uh, here's a fun fact for those of you who are thinking about sending your kids to COS and maybe uh, having them join our college Republicans here, that uh, since uh, I started, well, that sounds immodest, since 2007, uh, uh, students who have wanted to attend a UC uh, and have joined the college Republicans, we have a 100% placement rate. So. Uh, if you want to send your kids to a UC, give them to me. That doesn't sound satanic, yeah. does it? Yeah. We're, we're also going to be starting a cult. Uh, I'm getting an acoustic guitar moving up to the hills. So, uh, the cult of Steve Tootle. Yeah. Uh, the church of Steve Tootle. The church, right. Anyone want to ask a question while I'm standing up here with my face hanging out? Just to get us started? Yeah. I didn't say it wasn't a good tank. What I said was that the T-34, in, in 1941, there were only 1,400 modern tanks in the Soviet force. The Soviets had 20,000 tanks in 1941. 20,000 of, of them were destroyed by December. Uh, 20,000, they had 20,000, they lost 20,000. There's a symmetry there. The Soviets, the, the T-34 itself was an effective tank. It had a good gun, it had good armor, it had very good cross-country ability. What it didn't have, and a point that I've not mentioned in this lecture, is radios. Only one in five Soviet tanks had radios. Only one in five Soviet aircraft, aircraft had radios in 1941. The, they had to communicate with one another by popping open a hatch and making hand signals in combat. Uh, so yeah, it was an effective thing. They also didn't have very good range finding. Uh, the sighting for the T-34 early on was just used direct line of sight down the barrel. Uh, these things all improved over the, over the course of the war. And the one thing that the United States exceeded Soviet supplies, the Soviets asked for an awful lot of stuff. The one thing that we exceeded in supplies was radio equipment.
And by the end of the war, all of their tanks were supplied by radios. So does that answer your question? Yeah, it was a perfectly good platform. And actually, it worked very well for the rest of the war. Most of their art, uh, self-propelled artillery was on the T-34 chassis. The T-34 chassis itself was, in, to some degree, a, a, an American product. Uh, a guy named Christie had sold it to the Soviets before the war. The Americans rejected it. They didn't like it very much. The, the suspension system was actually designed by a, a very eccentric American inventor called Christie. Uh, but yeah. Who had the, mo the best designed tank in the war? Well, I mean, the T-34 always wins, and who am I to question the History Channel? But um, I think if I wanted to survive the war, probably a Tiger II. Or maybe a Joseph Stalin II, because they were really effective and they never went into action. My, my idea is just don't go into action. Uh, this, this was, the, the, the killing on the Eastern Front was beyond belief. Um, the, the, the death rates were, were enormous. If you were in the infantry in the Soviet Army at the outset of the war, it, the odds were very much against you surviving a year. There are almost no memoirs of people from the first year of the war. You ready for Stephen Lee's? Sure. All right. Uh, uh, as, regarding Soviet lend lease, did they repay us, and how about the British? The British actually repaid about three years ago, which made all the British newspapers headlines in all the British newspapers, and had no echo here. So, uh, you know, thank you very much, Britain. Um, the Soviets never repaid. Uh, there was a, fin a final deal between Nixon and Brezhnev uh, in the 1970s where we basically negated the, the debt. And, you know, to be honest, they paid the debt. And my, my point really is this. They paid in lives for the shortcomings of their economic and political system. But they used the stuff we gave them marvelously, and that saved American lives. And they're right about that. And, you know, it's not that there was some calculated thing on the part of, of Roosevelt to kill Russians. Uh, but they used the stuff very effectively, and they more than repaid a debt. I think we got our money's worth out, out of that. Uh, it beat the Germans. So. Uh, what happened to the supply route through the Pacific after Pearl Harbor? That was during, after Pearl Harbor. All of it was after Pearl Harbor. Um, the Japanese allowed them to go because they didn't want to ha tangle with the Russians. The Russians and the Soviets had signed a um, non-aggression pact in April of 1941, and both sides observed it strictly uh, to the point of the Soviets interning American flyers who landed by accident in Siberia. Um, the Japanese ob observed it completely strictly. They ha you had to give two months' notice if you were going to, uh, of your intent to break the pact. The Soviets gave two months' notice in, right after the defeat of Germany, and they kept their word, and they invaded uh, Manchuria and destroyed the, German, the Soviet Kwantung Army. They took 650,000 Japanese prisoners, which is nine times the number the Americans took in the Second World, World War, and they kept them for 10 years as slave laborers, uh, something that is not widely known and should be more widely known. Here's one that came up today uh, during class. Why did the relationship, or how did the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union get so bad after the war? Well, it hadn't been too good before the war at parts either. Um, it's because we had rather different views on the way things, uh, the way things should be run. Uh, the issues at stake at the end of the war were governance of Poland, uh, Eastern Europe, but on the Soviet part, governance of, of Italy and Japan. Uh, we certainly excluded them from an uh, occupation zone in Japan, which they wanted, uh, but the United States felt that it had done the heavy lifting there and it didn't allow the, the, either the British or the uh, Russians to have an occupation zone in Japan. Um, but it was quick, particularly the issue of Poland and uh, the promise of free and fair elections that was made at Yalta that stuck in the throat of the Americans and the imposition of communist states. Uh, Stalin saw this as a security issue, as he told uh, Milo Vangelis, who is a Yugoslav communist, this war is unlike others. In this war, we will impose our social system as far as our armies go. And he meant what he said. Uh, he was going to impose communist states where the Red Army was in control. And uh, the United States is, is somewhat hypocritical in this in one regard. Uh, Roosevelt was willing to accept a Soviet sphere of influence as payment to get the Russians into the war. And I use the Russians after having said I wouldn't. The, the Soviets into the war against the Japanese because there were these million men in, in Manchuria that the United States was transfixed with. What happens if they send those guys back to the homeland and we have to fight our way through Japan against this million man army? And there was a, a real desperation to get the Soviets into the war. And people were, were willing to look the other way uh, uh, when, when they did what they did in Eastern Europe. But when the Japanese collapsed, that 
reason disappeared with it. And so uh, the objections to Soviet behavior in Eastern Europe increased. Where was the uh, command center for the Soviet Union located during the Second World War? Moscow. Stavka. It was uh, Stalin. Stalin never withdrew from Moscow. In October of 1941, uh, virtually all the government offices withdrew to a place called Kuybyshev on the, on the Volga River. Stalin remained, and he remained with the skeleton staff of all his uh, major bureaucracies, the, the, the foreign ministry, the defense ministry, and Stavka. The headquarters was always in Moscow. He had his headquarters in uh, Pushkin Square in a, in a bunker, uh, Mayakovsky Square in a bunker underneath the, the uh, if any of you have been to Moscow, you know what I'm talking about. The Moscow Metro is really deep, and it was made that way on purpose as a bomb shelter. And you, you go down these incredibly fast escalators, like a, a couple hundred feet, and it, it's impervious to bombs of that time, and so they were there. Uh, did records show that prisoners uh, were retained long after the war? Yes, in the German case, they were retained until 1954. And in, and, and in the Japanese case. They were retained until 1954 when you had uh, the deal made with, with Khrushchev over, over Austria. Uh, please, this is like being quizzed. Okay. I just realized a rapid fire. Uh, please comment on the oil and diesel production of, uh, and Nazi sources in the Caspian. Well, the Nazis didn't have any sources in the Caspian. 85%, uh, they never got there. Uh, 85%, that was the target of Operation Blau, which was the drive on Stalingrad. They hoped to seize the Caspian Basin, which was the source of 85% of the Soviet oil supplies. They captured Maikop, which is on the northern slope of, of the Caucasus Mountains, which is an oil producing center. But the Soviets had managed in destroying it before they withdrew, and the Germans never got it into operation. They never got as far as, as Baku, which is the mother load for, for oil. So they never got to use it. But there's a, uh, um, Tews, what's his name, Abram Tews, uh, who's written a book on the German economy, says even if they'd gotten there, there, there wasn't the pipeline apparatus or the capacity for carrying it back to Germany. It would have taken years for them to develop the infrastructure to deliver the oil back. And in, in the meantime, they were fighting a war. So uh, this also came up today. Uh, let me try and uh, speak. I, I, I'm going to translate this. Speak in general about the role that the Nazi-Soviet pact played in the beginning. Uh, uh, it, do it in 35 seconds, go. <laughs> right. It was bad. No, the, 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 uh, Hitler and Stalin signed their pact in August of 1939. They div divvied up Eastern Europe between themselves. Uh, the Soviets gained 23 million new citizens. They occupied the three Baltic states, Eastern Poland, Bessarabia, and they also attempted to take all of Finland. Um, we, we now know they, they aimed to take the whole of the country. They didn't succeed. Uh, the Soviets got their heads handed to them in 1939 to 40 in a four-month war where they lost more people in that four-month war than the United States has lost in all of its wars since 1945, which is a striking figure. I love gee whiz facts. Uh, so, but the, the Finns held them off. The Soviets planned a second round in 1941, but other things came up that prevented them from launching a second attack. That is the German invasion intervened. Also, Hitler, Hitler uh, and Molotov met in 1940, and Hitler said he was very much opposed to another war in the Baltic, and relations were such they didn't want to risk relations with the, with the Germans. But the Soviets wanted, to, they had a, a general staff plan. I now have the general staff plan. Molotov told Hitler that they wanted the same arrangement in Finland as already existed in the Baltic states, which is incorporation into the Soviet Union. They just didn't get away with it. The question is then why they didn't do it in 1944. And there, the, the reason is, is also understandable. The Soviets were pushed to the wall in 1944. They'd lost, by that point, probably seven, eight million people dead. Um, they were uh, getting supplies from the United States. They were afraid the United States reaction would be very negative if, if the Soviets occupied all of Finland. It just wasn't worth it to them to do it. So uh, this one is something I will now admit to. Uh, I've been teaching wrong now for my entire career. I will never do so again. But it came up in a question. So, uh, do we understand Stalin's apparent, uh, apparent uh, I can't make out the word, but delay, dissonance at the time of the initial invasion and that delay of... Uh, uh, at, yeah, this is a really complex question. And he's not as surprised as people think. Uh, the, the, it's gone down in history as him being shocked that Hitler attacked. He wasn't. Uh, he was aware of the buildup down to unit level strength. He got very good intelligence reports, which I've read, and they're available in Russian. Um, the question was not the buildup. He knew the buildup was taking place. The question is what Hitler intended to do with that buildup. And there are a couple things that were in Stalin's mind. One was that Tsar Nicholas II 
had mobilized in 1914, and the mobilization had triggered the German counter-mobilization and led to the First World War. He was reluctant to do something that would provoke Hitler to attack. So he was, he was very careful not to provoke him. At the same time, and this isn't widely known, he, 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 involved, he was involved in something called the creeping up to war. He mobilized quietly and behind the front 800,000 troops, which were east of Smolensk, which is quite a bit east of the, of the front line. This was really important because those 800,000 people were the second line of defense after the first line disappeared. Remember I gave you those figures on how much of the, of the army disappeared. So it was very crucial and it was probably a war winning, uh, at least a, a battle winning uh, uh, method. Now, why didn't he think Hitler was going to attack them? Uh, a lot of his intelligence pointed to two different directions. He was getting information that said Hitler's going to attack now. He had other information that said Hitler's only going to attack after he finishes with the British Empire. He's just building up to, uh, to get more concessions in terms of raw materials from, from the Soviet Union. He also, there, there, it, it gets very complex, but he, he got information from the British. The British themselves did not decide until late April that the attack was going to come against the Soviet Union. However, Churchill was warning him right along that the attack was coming. Stalin had excellent spies in Britain, such excellent spies that they were actually transcribing private conversations in the British Embassy, which I've read. Uh, they, were, uh, they, they had spies throughout Britain. And they knew that the British had not made up their mind. The British still believed that the principal blow was going to come against them until April. But they were telling Stalin that the principal blow was going to come against him. Now, if you're Stalin and you're suspicious of the British, which he was, do you think, don't you think maybe they're lying to you? And, so, and also, several people had warned him that there, were, there was going to be a date certain of an attack in May. May came, May went, no attack. Uh, my own view is he felt that, yes, it was dangerous, but that the possibility existed of negotiating some kind of, at least prolonging negotiations to the summer of 1941. Nobody but a madman, and I don't think Hitler was mad, evil, but not mad. He wasn't going to attack in September. Nobody would attack the Soviet Union in September. And if you could delay them long enough through negotiations, you'd buy one more year. Stalin himself told that Harriman that. He told a number of people that. Molotov has said that as late as the 1980s. I think that was, that was, was, it wasn't a surprise so much as a miscalculation. And that sort of answers the second part of that question, I think. Now, um, this one, I, I'll just read it the way it's written. You tried to make the case that the largesse enabled 7 million Soviet soldiers to stay on the front lines. But isn't it just as true that the same largesse helped defeat the Germans in Europe, saving far more in terms of U.S. lives and funds. Yes, yes, I said that. Yeah. Thank you for uh, reinfor reinforcing my point, whoever that was. Yeah, of course, it saved American lives. It was the most enlightened act of statesmanship that Roosevelt ever engaged in. Had, had the actual size of the assistance been known widely in the United States, that, and priority was given to supplies to the, to the Soviet Union, not to American troops, believe it or not, by order of Roosevelt, had the size of the assistance been known, a lot of people would have said, why isn't this going to our guys? I think it was an incredibly courageous and quite wise decision to give it to the Soviets because they were killing the most Germans. And this, it was very explicitly that. They're killing the Germans. And not only that, it'll save American lives. And it, it'll get them killed sooner. And, and as, as Averill Harriman said, the American ambassador later on, and a friend of, of Roosevelt's, he said, it will spare us the ghastly business of doing it ourselves. Yes, of course, I agree with your point entirely. Uh, I'm going to summarize some of these points, but uh, assess whether or not Russians had poor military leaders. Had poor military leaders? Well, they had some of the best military, military leaders in the war. I think Zhukov was one of the best operational leaders to emerge in the Second World War. They certainly had costly methods, and Zhukov was not all that careful about his men's lives. Um, they also didn't have the lavishly equipped armed forces. That the, the United States went into battle in a Cadillac. Uh, the, the Russians went in in a Yugo. And you know, the difference, it, and this is not to disparage the Russians, they didn't have an economy that could produce the wealth of, of equipment that the Americans went into combat with. Uh, equipment saves lives. Uh, High-tech equipment saves lives. And, and the, the Soviets lost it because they didn't have that. Zhukov was an incredibly, I can, I can sit here, stand here and list you effective Soviet commanders until dawn. Zhukov was the most effective. Timoshenko uh, was a very effective uh, uh, commander of defense forces. Uh, Rokossovsky, uh, Chuikov, um, Konyev. The, all these guys were very, very able commanders. And they, they, they got the job done. And they, they've been disparaged in history because oh, it's just the Russians. Uh, they inflicted huge defeats on the Germans. In, in 19, the 1941 defeat, in the summer of 1941, uh, 44, excuse me, uh, 
is, is, as I said, the largest defeat in German military history. It tore away a third of the German army in the East. And it was a, a mastery. It, it, was, it was a marvel of, of military art. They had the Germans absolutely convinced the attack was going to come elsewhere. They also had the, uh, them convinced, even after it had started, that the objectives were different than they were. And they'd prepositioned their forces in a spot in the prepet marshes where the Germans thought mechanized warfare was impossible. And they built subterranean or uh, uh, subwater pontoon bridges to bring the, uh, the, the, the tracked vehicles in. They, they infiltrated the German lines. They were behind the Germans before the Germans knew they were there. And not only that, they prepositioned supplies, so they had a second and a third wave of attacks. And they carried the offensive all the way from Mojais, which people don't know where that is, Smolensk, all the way from Smolensk to Warsaw in the space of only a few weeks. It was a, a, a masterpiece of military art. So yeah, they had very effective commanders. I wouldn't want to be in the Soviet army, but they had very effective commanders. Um, why didn't the United States uh, publicize the uh, massacre in the Katyn Forest? Ah, well, um, both the United States and the British did their own internal studies of the Katyn massacre, and they came to the conclusion that it was the Soviets who'd done it. Uh, the, uh, um, the fellow who ran the American Review was too persistent in saying that it should be published, and he was reassigned to American Samoa. Um, in, in, in Britain, it was quelled by Rose, uh, Churchill himself, who said, there's nothing to be gained by prowling morbidly around the graves of Smolensk. And that was it. In other words, there are allies. You really want to fight over this in 1943 when, when the Germans are still alive? Uh, it was quelled, squelched. So would you rank, that leads into the next one, would you consider that to be the biggest war crime committed by the Soviets? Oh, it's a big one. Uh, um, the, the, the mass rapes in, in Eastern Europe were pretty big. I, I, I don't know how you avail, evaluate. It's, it's a big one. It's, it, it was, was 15,000 army officers and 7,000 civilians. It's a pretty darn cold-blooded killing. And it's one of the largest murders up to that point in European history, uh, modern European history. So it, it, you know, other than the Armenians, which was 1915 in Turkey, it's a pretty darn big massacre. And it's genocidal in intent. So, it's big. Is it the biggest? I, that's a game I don't play. Uh, what about the perception of the importance of Leningrad and the famous battle there? Uh, are there newly discovered misconceptions there? Yes. Uh, yes, there are several. Um, one is that they didn't evacuate the civilian population in time, in part because they were deporting the Germans, the ethnic Germans and the Finns who were in the area, who had done nothing wrong, essentially. But they, they gave them transport out and gave them transport out. They shipped them out in cattle cars. Um, they had a, a concentration camp working in the, in the Leningrad encirclement, which I did not know. Uh, and I've actually seen the correspondence relating to feeding them. And they got fed rations, which were lower than those in Leningrad, if you can believe it. Um, probably one in seven or one in eight of the victims in the Leningrad uh, blockade were victims of, of the NKVD. They were very active, and they shot anybody who complained or was, was waiver. Zhukov was in charge of defense from September of 41 until uh, around December. And he was the first one to institute blocking units, which mo many of you know about, machine guns set up behind the front to shoot people who waver. Uh, so there was that sort of stuff. Um, he also, the Germans also sent a peace delegation over trying to persuade Leningrad to surrender. And Zhukov had them shot and said that anybody who parleys with them or anybody who parleys with the Germans is going to be responsible for the loss of Leningrad and therefore the loss of the war, and they deserve what they get. So he was a pretty tough guy, and they were, these were pitiless times. Are there, there any further questions for uh, Dr. Miner? Very, very good question. In fact, the Soviets have just published for the first time this week in Russian, on, online, you can get it. Um, the question was, oh, uh, how, did yes. the Soviets how did the Soviets react to the discovery of the German concentration camps at the end of the war? First, first point, the Soviets liberated the death camps. The Americans claim they did. Uh, the, the camps that the Americans and the British uh, liberated were not death camps. They were labor camps. The death camps, Ray, Ravensbrück had a gas chamber, but the, uh, the real death camps were in Poland. Uh, Auschwitz, Sobibor, Belzec, all, the, all these places were in Poland, and they were all liberated by the Soviets. Um, the Soviets uh, did publicize it, 
Uh, they also had the first reports. The first reports are in Russian, and they've just been published this week. Uh, uh, and I, I have yet to read them. I have them uh, bookmarked, and I'm going to read them when I go home. Uh, but they're reports of, of the, the first eyewitness reports of, of Auschwitz. Um, they wrote the first account of Auschwitz. And they then also uh, uh, prepared the first documentation of the Holocaust, the so-called Black Book of, of Soviet Jewry, it was called. Uh, it's got a long, long title. The Black Book of German-Soviet Occupational Crimes Against the... I can never remember. The, it's a very long title. But it's, it's shortened to The Black Book. And uh, it was not published in the Soviet Union. It was eventually published in the United States. It wasn't published in the Soviet Union because they... they um, Sherbakov, who was in charge of propaganda, said, you shouldn't divide the dead, and this claims that the Jews suffered more than other people. We all suffered. And, and also, the real reason is because to document the Holocaust meant to document the collaboration of a lot of Soviet citizens. And that really didn't look good when they claimed that there had been nothing but fraternal peace between the various peoples. So it was suppressed, and it wasn't published in Russian until the fall of the Soviet Union. But yeah, they did, they did publish the death camps. They, they made sure that the first... Uh, account in the newspapers was published by Konstantin Simonov. Uh, the first person to see the death camps was actually Vasily Grossman, but he was Jewish, and they didn't want somebody Jewish writing the first account. They wanted an ethnic Russian to write it. So. Yes. The more effective leader? Oh, hands down, Stalin. Mm -hmm. Without contest, Stalin. St uh, who is the more effective military leader, Hitler or Stalin, and given the, the hands on activity of both, and you said the insanity of Hitler? I think Hitler eventually went nuts, but I don't think he was nuts in the early stages. Uh, Stalin was not, I don't believe, clinically paranoid. I think he became that way in the late 1940s and early 50s just from the strain of being at the top of the peak for so long. Uh, he was a morbidly suspicious person, but he was a very effective uh, combat, uh, uh, military leader because he learned. Uh, Hitler became more inclined to intervene in local decisions. There, the, the saying was you couldn't change a sentry from the front door to the window without getting Berlin's permission. Uh, Stalin learned to give the professionals some space to make decisions. Doesn't mean he didn't punish them if they, if they didn't do well. He still shot people throughout the war, including generals. But he did not interfere in operational decisions to the same degree, and he learned over time. Uh, he was much more effective at that. Now, Hitler had had his successes in the early war, to be sure, and Stalin had his failures in the early war. But if you have arcs of learning, Stalin's arc goes up and Hitler's goes down uh, during the war. Good question. Yeah, uh, the, the wars are similar and they're, they're different. I mean, they're obviously uh, one was a, not a modern industrialized war, uh, and the Soviet Union was. Um, Stalin's uh, strategy was quite different from that of, of, of the Tsar. The, 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 the strategy, and there's a very good book, a recent book by uh, Levin, uh, Dominic Levin, on the uh, Russia against Napoleon. Very, very good book. But their, their approach from the early on was to trade time for space, or trade space for time, excuse me, uh, in, in, against Napoleon, and not to give him a decisive battle, which is what he wanted. Of course, they fought at Borodino, but even after that, they pull back, they give up Moscow. You know, where does Napoleon hit after that? That was never Hitler, Stalin's intention. Stalin uh, wanted to hang on to every clod of Soviet earth early on, and it cost an enormous amount. Now, in terms of the Germans, which is, I think, the point of your question, didn't they ever learn from Napoleon? Um, many of them, uh, the, 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 there's memoirs of, of uh, Colincourt, the Duke of uh, Vicenza, who, was, who accompanied uh, Napoleon into Russia. They sold out in Berlin before the invasion. It was one of the signs, actually, the invasion was going to take place. Uh, people started reading up on Napoleon. And there was a great deal of concern on the part of the Germans that they might duplicate this. But the thing is, remember, Napoleon's a long time ago. If you're Hitler, and if you're a German of 1941, you remember two things. One is you beat the Russians in 1917. They collapsed. 
And that's, a, that's something that people remembered. It could be done. The second thing they thought of is, we beat the French. We took four years and we didn't beat them in 1914 to 1918. The internal combustion engine has solved the problem of distance. That was the belief. That the, and the German modern technical weaponry and aircraft and this sort of thing had solved the problem and that they could deliver such a blow that it would collapse. And then you got to add in Soviet ra uh, German racism. They believed that there, there was a thin crust of Jews who ruled over a much thicker population of Slavs who were basically mindless slaves. And you crack the control, the Jewish controls of the state, and the whole thing will disintegrate. As Hitler said, we kick the door in and the whole rotten structure will collapse. That was the, the way he went in. And uh, uh, Goebbels referred to a house of cards. And you know, one of my colleagues points out, yeah, you know, they did kick the, the door in and a lot of the structure collapsed, but it wasn't a peasant hut, it was the winter palace. In other words, it was a really big building. And space didn't help them. Uh, it wasn't the only thing that won it for the Soviets, but it was a very important thing. But the Germans were on a roll in 1941. They'd beaten the, they, they controlled all of Europe. They controlled France. They'd beaten France. They, they'd taken out the Balkans in the space of a couple months campaigning. They'd driven the British off the continent. Uh, they thought they had solved the problems of distance. They should have paid more attention to climate. By the way, one of the points that, sorry, but one of the points that I would like to make that's a revelation, and we, we now have a lot of letters from the front, and one of the, one of the myths of the, of the front is that the Germans weren't prepared for the war, the winter in 1941, but the Soviets were. The first part of that's true, the Germans weren't prepared, because they thought the war would be over in six to eight weeks. The Soviets weren't prepared. They were still in their summer uniforms in late November. They weren't getting warm food in late November. They didn't get any leave. Uh, they, were, they were in their, their, their summer caps. They, they didn't, th these photographs of them in their furry snowsuits, those are what pho photographs got published. They didn't publish photographs that showed them standing there in front of a fire freezing to death. Uh, the, the Soviet army was very poorly equipped in 1941. Romania, Romania, and eventually from their synthetic, uh, their, uh, their synthetic production from coal. Uh, it, it was slow to ramp up, but they, they, they also had, the Soviets, when, when, during the period of the Nazi-Soviet pact, the Soviets had supplied them with a large amount of oil. They supplied them with enough oil to last them until January 1942. So they invaded the Soviet Union with the oil supplied by the Soviets. Um, they then, when they realized this was running short, they did produce synthetic fuel. But uh, the Americans finally caught on in 1940, late 43, that this was the real, Achille transport and oil were the two Achilles heels of the German war economy. They started bombing oil, that was the end of things. Uh, because they, 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 we started bombing Ploesti, which was the major uh, source for, for oil from, from Romania, and started bombing uh, trains. And it, it, was, it was over. By 1944, it was over. A lot of people got killed, and the, the killing went up in 1944. But the war was essentially lost, strategically, and any sensible leader would have surrendered, but you know, Hitler was Hitler. Yeah, one more. Mm The question is, uh, how, um, that weren't the Japanese and Germans allies? Why were the Japanese allowing supplies to go into the Soviet Union? And why were they so concerned about annoying? They, they, were, they were allies, but they were fighting parallel wars. They were not fighting identical wars. The Japanese, you know, they had a common enemy, but they had one uncommon enemy. <laughs> the, the Japanese were tied down in China. and It was a mess. And the, Jap the last thing the Japanese needed was to take on another enemy. And uh, they decided this just wasn't worth it to them. And so, uh, yeah, probably Hitler believed in 1941 and 1942 that he could deliver a knockout blow to the Soviet Union, which would not require Japanese intervention. By the time the Japanese might have thought of intervening in 1943, the idea of the Germans of just delivering a knockout blow was long gone. Speaking of liberation, I need to liberate you from your 14-hour work day that it's we've been given a, you. Well, I can answer your question later. Oh, well, the last question. Okay, last fine. question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, 
<laughs> I've got the general staff plans for the possibility of a German attack, and they said, Romania and Finland are both going to join the German attack for purposes of revenge. So they knew that their, their behavior towards the Romanians and the Finns had annoyed them to the point that they allied with the Germans. Their effect was twofold. First of all, the Romanians supplied oil. Absolutely critical, the major supply of oil to the, so to the, to the Germans. The, for the Finns, it extended the Soviet defensive line all the way to the Arctic. And it made the, the, the critical rail line to Murmansk vulnerable to attack uh, be, uh, along the whole distance of it. So th that was it. The, the other thing it did, too, uh, Stalin later claimed wrongly that the reason for his invasion of Finland in 3940 had been to protect Leningrad. In fact, it ensured Leningrad was going to be surrounded because the Finns moved in from the north. They didn't shell Leningrad, unlike the Germans who shelled it and were, were absolutely barbarous. The, the Finns took their territory back but they didn't let supplies through. And so the siege of Leningrad was in part as bloody and horrible as it was because the Finns cut off the northern approaches to the city. So yeah, it was a disaster to, to annoy those two little countries and they played a disproportionately important role. The Romanians also supplied, both the Finns and the Romanians fought on the Axis side. The Finns only in Finland. The Romanians fought on the Russian front in the southern portion of the Russian front. They occupied much of Ukraine and they actually covered the flanks controversially of the, Red, of the uh, Sixth Army in 1942, and that was precisely where the blow went to Stalingrad. They tore the Romanian army apart. So, uh, Dr. Miner's book is coming out soon. The, the Fury's Unleashed. Please look for it uh, when it comes out. Please join me in thanking Dr. Miner. Thank you. Make sure and turn in your surveys before you go to someone wearing one of these gray shirts. And thank you all for coming.